Welcome to Discovering. This winter, Kristen was in Curtis for some ice fishing on Manistique Lake. This time of year, they should be really aggressive, eating like crazy, getting ready to spawn. Then we'll take a look at some of our springtime birds and talk with the DNR about bird feeders and bears. They typically have a route and they go from bird feeder to bird feeder. Stuck around, it's Monday night and time for discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a longtime lover of northern Michigan. For a change of scenery, I took a ride to Curtis on the eastern end of the UP to see what the fishing was like on the Manistique Lakes. We're nestled between two lakes. We've got Big Manistique that's over 10,000 acres. We got South Manistique that's over 4,700 acres. You got North Manistique. There's a bunch of little lakes surrounding us. And it's great for anybody that likes to be outdoors. First, I stopped at Mick's Bait Shop for the fishing report. Actually, the bite is kicking up a notch. Right now, you're after the a lot of guys go after walleye all the time, but the pike is good right now. Bluegills, crappies, which are bluegills and crappies are gonna come out of south. We've had some large pike taken out of the lakes here the last few days. Uh, we've had a 45 and a 47, uh, 38s and 39s. There's been some decent walleyes, 24s, 25s, so the bite is kicking up a bit. We always stress to everybody, use extreme caution on that ice. It's really good fishing right now. So it's just a matter of being safe, being cautious, and getting out there and having some fun doing it. I caught up with fishing guide John Run on the Manistique Lake, along with his buddy Chris and some guys from the Lower Peninsula just before lunchtime. I missed the morning bite and they had caught a few walleyes. This time of year they should be really aggressive, eating like crazy, getting ready to spawn. Nope, just a little perch again probably. Moving home. After lunch, we headed down to South Manistique Lake for the afternoon bite for bluegills and crappies. John also put down some tip-ups in hopes of catching some walleye and northern pike. So today we're out here fishing in Curtis, and we're catching a lot of walleyes and pike on tip-ups. So I just wanted to show you guys how I have these tip-ups rigged up. I have 20-pound test beaver dam ice line on my tip-ups, and then they go down to a barrel swivel with 10-pound test mono leader with a little split shot and I have a number 10 trouble hook. And we're just putting a, either a blue shiner or a small sucker on the trouble hook, and just hooking it right underneath the dorsal fin. And we're just putting it about a foot off bottom, or if we're above the, on a weed bed, we're putting it about a foot above the weeds. And then once I get my depth, like when, once I use a depth finder and get my depth, I'll use this little bobber to mark the depth. So then we can use these flags all day long and not have to worry about if the depth moves on the line. We always have that marker there for the depth. The sun was shining and the wind was blowing and the fish weren't biting as good as John would have liked. I blame the camera, not the guide or the weather. After drilling one hole after another, they finally jigged up some crappies.
If you find yourself fishing near the Curtis area, then you need to stop in Mix Bait Shop for your bait and tackle. The website, stepoutside.org, listed Mix as the number three bait shop in Michigan and the only one on the list in the UP, so therefore it must be the number one bait shop in the UP. Well, we are a traditional bait shop. We're one of the last traditional bait shops around in the state. We've been here almost 80 years. Mick and Dave purchased the bait shop back in 2014. We've had some fun with it. We're just turning it into a nice little shop. We want everybody to go out and have fun fishing and have some fun in the town of Curtis. We've got t-shirts, hoodies, and the hats are coming. We carry minnows, crawlers, leaf worms, wax worms, mousy spikes, all that good stuff. At any given time, we can have 50 gallons of minnows sitting here just to accommodate our customers. These are blues. Golden shiners. We're pretty well known for our pike suckers. These are our pike suckers. These are our small suckers. See the difference? And then we have our perch shiners. We try to carry a good line of bait and tackle here. Stuff's always changing, so we want to bring the new stuff in, keep it coming, keep everybody on the new stuff as it comes in. You can find a little bit of everything inside Mick's Bait Shop. When I was there, the store was set for ice fishing, and they were just about to start stocking the place full of inventory for spring and summer. Like I said, it's a complete change out for summer. Yeah. I mean, we do a, a bunch more camping stuff and musky fishing. If the guys are into musky fishing, we got the great big reels for that that they look for that they can't find. We started our tackle company, Hooked on Tackle. My dad had a tackle route when I was a kid, so I was tying snells before I could see over the kitchen table. We just got to the point that we needed some of the product that the guys were after, and I couldn't get it out of my supply houses or it was in limited supply and we needed more. So we said, okay, let's just do this. I, I can tie crawler harnesses with my eyes closed, so that's what we do. We do a lot of our custom paint our jigs. We do a lot of crawler harnesses, or part of our snells. We've got custom sinkers here. Mick says she also gets a lot of calls for custom lures. We do a lot of different stuff if somebody wants it. We can typically make it up for them from large musky flies down to, like I said, the, the snells or the sinkers, whatever. So give us a shout, we'll do our best to accommodate you. Here's some of our beaded snells we do. It's a piece of line with a hook. We just put a, a bead and hook on it and a blade. We've got regular plain snells too. It's just an easy way to tie on a hook. You can just put a, a safety snap on and there's a little loop on it so you can just attach it right to your line that way so you don't have to tie a hook every time. Makes it a lot faster and sometimes the fish actually bite better with it. So That's an ultra minnow that we custom paint. We go from half ounce clear up to eight ounce in these. We get a lot of guys like them for lake trout or downstate on Saginaw Bay, St. Clair Shores and like that for jigging. Shop. Right now it's available at the shop. Hopefully this spring we'll have our online store up and running. So then we'll be able to accommodate everybody everywhere. So. With open water fishing just around the corner, I asked Mick for some reasons to come back to Curtis in the spring and summer. You guys like bass fishing? These are phenomenal bass lakes. I've seen four and five pounders consistently come out of these two lakes. So if you want to get into some fun in the summer, come up here bass fishing. The other thing we do in the spring is our Curtis Clash. That is a bass and walleye tournament. What we do is the first weekend in June, because that's the opener of bass. That just gets everybody out there, gets the, the summer started for everybody. And we have some fun with that. Here again, we make it a fun family tournament. The kids are into it and everything. You can check out Mick's Facebook page for the latest fishing reports. The guys that John had out fishing decided to call her a day in the afternoon and I was left to guard a few tip-ups while John brought them to shore. I told them I was going to catch all the big fish after they left and sure enough, a flag went up. I had it and as soon as the pike got to the bottom of the hole, it snapped the line on the bottom of the ice and it felt like a nice one. As I sat there and pouted, a second flag went off. Ah! 
this time, I was careful not to let the line hit the bottom of the ice. I wasn't letting this one get away, and I didn't want John to come back to two snapped lines. John came back moments after I yanked that pike out of the hole and I was probably grinning from ear to ear. Really we stuck around for another couple hours, fishing and talking. This was earlier in the winter, before social distancing. Uh, I've been guiding on the ice for a few years. It's been really good. I've had a lot of happy clients, a lot of really good fishing. Everyone's like completely different. Like these guys like I had today, they don't want to be babysat at all. They, they want to do their own thing and like I still ask these guys like all the time, you know, do you need anything or whatever? But they always say no. A lot of people are like, just, they have, they keep me busy, much more busy. Most of my clients, they hire a guide because either they've never fished before or don't know how to ice fish. So a lot of it is just like teaching them, like teaching them how to use a Vexlar, teaching them how to drill holes through the ice, you know, that kind of stuff. After drilling another half dozen holes, John got us on some panfish and he started reeling them up one after another. Like that one just did. A lot of guys will drill a few holes and set up their shack and just wait for the fish to come to them. And I'm more of a, an aggressive fisherman. I'd rather go to the fish. I don't have the patience to just sit in one spot all day and, and wait or hope that the fish come to me. So I drill a lot of holes and I look for the fish instead of waiting for them to come to me. I hear like a lot of my buddies and stuff will be like, Man, I went out there and fish tree told me to, but I didn't catch nothing. I'm like, well, how many holes did you drill? Well, I drilled five. I'm like, huh. Well, if you would have drilled 20, you probably would have found them. <laughs> As we all know, the fish bite when you're paying least attention. A few more flags went up and we each pulled up another northern. As the sun started to set, we decided to call it a day. It was a good time out on the ice, wind and all, because there is no such thing as a bad day fishing. It's April in the Upper Peninsula. One of the few things we can count on is not being able to count on the weather. You might be cooking out on the grill on Monday and plowing snow on Wednesday. You could go camping in a t-shirt and do some winter camping in the same week. But sooner or later it will indeed turn into spring and stay that way till summer arrives. And spring means the return of a variety of birds that were smart enough to get out of here last fall. A sure sign of spring is the calls of Canada geese. Often mistakenly referred to as Canadian geese. During the second year of their lives, they find a mate and stay together the rest of their life. Watch for them nesting in elevated areas near water. And of course, geese are accompanied by ducks of all sorts. Another early bird is a member of the thrush family, the American robin. They've spent the winter vacationing along the Pacific coast from southern Canada to Mexico. Michigan shares the robin as their state bird with Connecticut and Wisconsin. 
Sandhill cranes engage in unison calling, where the cranes stand close together, calling in a synchronized duet. The female makes two calls for every one from the male. Loons return to northern forested lakes and rivers in the springtime, usually in April or early May, and stay till about late October to early November. They spend the winter season along the Atlantic, Pacific, and Gulf of Mexico coasts, with some wintering on inland reservoirs. Red-winged blackbirds travel in single-sex flocks, and males usually arrive a few days before the females. Once they reach the location where they plan to breed, the males stake out territories by singing. The common name, as well as the scientific name of the Northern Cardinal, refers to the cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church, who wear distinctive red robes and caps. They are the state bird of seven states, more than any other species. Many hummingbirds spend the winter in Central America or Mexico and migrate north to their breeding grounds in the southern United States as early as February and to areas further north later in the spring. Hummingbirds fly by day when nectar sources such as flowers are more abundant. Common grackles travel in big flocks. They have big appetites and they can monopolize your bird feeder, especially during the spring and fall migrations in March to April and September to October. Most gross beaks fly across the Gulf of Mexico in a single night although some migrate over land around the Gulf. Gross beaks that winter in Panama and northern South America tend to be from the eastern parts of the breeding range, while those wintering in Mexico and Central America tend to be from the western parts. The Baltimore Oriole gets its name from the resemblance of the male's colors to those of the coat of arms of Lord Baltimore. They spend summer and winter in entirely different ranges. From early April to late May, flocks arrive in eastern and central North America to breed from Louisiana through central Canada. In the winter, the indigo bunting makes its home in southern Florida and north South America. It can be spotted from southern Canada to northern Florida during the breeding season and often migrates by night using the stars to navigate. Indigo buntings fly about 1,200 miles each way between their breeding grounds in eastern North America and wintering areas from southern Florida to northern South America. Its habitat is farmland, brush areas, and open woodland. Scarlet tanagers usually migrate at night and fly across the Gulf of Mexico between their wintering grounds in South America and their breeding grounds in eastern North America. They prefer large, undisturbed tracts of forest, but during migration can show up in a broader variety of forests as well as backyards. With the arrival of this springtime choir, we automatically do our best to coax them into close range so we can, well, bird watch. Bring on the bird feeder smorgasbord. But you may want to keep in mind that birds are not the only wildlife in search of an easy meal at this time of year. And now that spring is here, just a little yearly reminder that our black bears are out of their dens and looking for an easy food source. So now is the time to put your bird feeders away. They're starting to come out of dens and you know to avoid as much nuisance bear issues as we can bird feeders are always the issue the birds don't need it now so it's a great time to take them down um, and or if you choose to leave them up and you have a bear visit to take them down at least for a couple of weeks and uh, that will take care of 99 percent of our bear problems they're almost all bird feeders or bird feed that's stored in cans or on porches or whatever. If we take care of all of that material, then, then that should take care of most of our bear issues. And uh, m many of our local people know that already. It's, it's, it's a pretty common issue that when they come out in the spring, there's nothing else to eat. So they head directly to where they know the best source of food is, and they typically have a route and they go from bird feeder to bird feeder. So if you can get ahead of the game and, and pull those down while you're thinking of it, that will avoid those visits. And sometimes they're not very friendly to the bird feeders and smash them up. So it's a good time to, to pull things in. If Like when they're accessing a bird feeder, they might uh, tear a screen or uh, bend over a pole or something like that. But uh, that, that'll be, there's usually a flurry of that before uh, the berries come ripe. And um, as soon as they come ripe, then the complaints drop off to almost nothing. So um, it's, it's all about, a, you know, an easy food source first thing in spring. And remembering that hummingbird feeders are sugar water, bears love sugar water, so a hummingbird feeder is also an attractant. So make sure if you're putting those out or when you do that you keep them inaccessible if at all possible. And if a bear comes around, pull them in for a couple of weeks and, and let the bear go on to its natural food sources. Well, that's it for this week. 
Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.